Live Cyhawk Game Day is sponsored by Nissan. Welcome into Cyhawk Game Day on Local 5. I'm John Schaefer. Jeff Woody back in studio with us as the Cyclones are on the road at Kansas State in the Little Apple. A strange place to play football. Weird things happen there. Did anything ever happen weird down there when you were playing? Well, we had an hour and a half lightning delay one of the games that we played down there, and it rained the entire rest of the game. Uh, so the game, I think, in total runtime was about five and a half hours. Weird stuff always happens in Manhattan. Another thing that doesn't happen in Manhattan, Iowa State wins, unfortunately. Of course, we'll talk about that in just a bit. Hawkeyes at home for a 2.30 kickoff here on Local 5 against Purdue. And who would have thought the Hawkeyes would be the highest ranked team in the Big Ten and the only unbeaten team in the Big Ten West? At this point, you know, we know we're going to get the team's best shot every week. There's no, there's no easy games. Um, you know, Coach O'Keefe, uh, Coach Ferentz, you know, one of the biggest things that they're preaching right now, which I think is a really cool concept, is the, the law of the price tag. Uh, and it's essentially that um, the price never goes down. It only goes up. Uh, and, and in order to be successful, everyone on the team has to pay the price. So it's easy to slip into the mode of, um, oh, you know, we're 6-0, and blah, 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 you know, we're ranked high, it, you know, this is, you know, games are going to get easier. No, nothing gets easier. It only gets harder. Well, that's only the truth for the Hawkeyes. Here's a look at the standings for the Big Ten West. Still very early and a lot of season left, but Iowa there at 3-0 in Big Ten play. Minnesota and Purdue at 1-1, then a bunch of sub-500 teams. Huskers might be the best 3-4 team in the country. Not shown. Northwestern, no need to show them. They're pretty lowly right now, Jeff. Yeah, Northwestern's got a lot of work to do. The Big Ten West is an interesting conference because, yeah, you look at the, the, the rest of those standings, Wisconsin, not a bad team, not winning much. Nebraska, not a bad team, not winning much. Minnesota, high expectations. Then they get a bunch of injuries. They lose their best offensive player. All of a sudden, it's hard for them to score points now. Yep. So this Big Ten West is not necessarily wide open at all. Iowa has an absolute stranglehold on it. The Big Ten is a strong conference, and it comes from the east, which yep. is where their main opponents are going to ride. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit, too. Iowa-Purdue kickoff 230 from Connect. You can catch it right here on Local 5. Iowa 1-3 versus Purdue the last four seasons. Meanwhile, the Iowa State Cyclones, you know, coming out of the bye week, trip to Kansas State, big opportunity for them to show that they can compete against good football teams. A little bit of urgency in that locker room as well. They can calm some fears though. Here's what the Cyclones had to say about coming out of this bye week earlier today. Relaxing a little bit, you know, look again, looking back on the, the, the first five weeks of the season and it's really the longest week of the year because game weeks just fly, you know, like it's almost like our bye week felt longer than the first five weeks of the season. It's great to have veteran leadership that understands what, man, the next six, seven weeks feels like and looks like the importance of getting better week in and week out and how critical that is to um, the success of our football team. You know, I, I think I said a little bit last night on a radio show, we've been in this moment uh, very similarly the last four to five years in our football program. So, you know, it's no different and we've either succeeded, in my opinion, became the best version of ourselves or we didn't and you know there's I think a lot of lessons to be learned through those experiences. Farmageddon kicks off at 6 30 tonight on ESPN 2 so that gives you plenty of time to get to the pumpkin patch spend a little family time then hunker down and watch what should be a good good game down there in Manhattan. Last time I asked you won at K-State 2004. Jeff and I were well just in high school maybe even middle school. Up next on Cyhawk Game Day we'll break down those cyclones a little bit more plus a look at the Big 12 picture as a whole. Alrighty, a trip to Manhattan is just in time for the Wildcats to return their quarterback, Skylar Thompson, who's a game changer. ISU knows they'll have their hands full with the Wildcats QB tonight. We didn't really face him last year, um, but, you know, he's a, he's a great player. Um, I'm excited to play him, but, you know, he brings a different threat. He, the biggest thing with me that stands out to his game is he's just super smart, super relaxed back there. He's really comfortable. He's played a lot of snaps, and he, it shows on film. I, I don't, it's probably not fair to say this sometimes as the opposing coach, but, you know, he is one of my favorite players that we've played against in this conference because he is tough. Um, from day one, he started as a freshman. Um, he is a winner. He knows how to win. He knows how to compete. He brings it. Um, you know, I, I think he's probably one of the hardest competitors that we've gone against since I've been at Iowa State. That might be an understatement. Of course, Thompson started as a freshman for the Wildcats and, and really been impressive last year. 
We've talked about it, a bit of an anomaly because he wasn't in that lineup and starting at quarterback, so Iowa State was able to really take advantage. Today, tonight's going to be a totally different story. Yeah, and, and last year, Kansas State had, I think it was something in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 COVID mm -hmm. uh, uh, players missing from that game so you can almost throw last year out and just yeah. say you know what didn't happen let's not watch that film and especially because Skylar Thompson didn't play Skylar Thompson is a tremendously difficult quarterback to defend when he does his job correctly because of one word conflict if you have an offense that you can put someone in conflict I'm gonna run our linebackers off with tight ends so we're gonna run the corners off of the wide receiver and then just one defensive end and we're gonna run three guys at this defensive end if he picks one I've got two others to choose from mm -hmm. the way you run that offense is by having patience Skylar Thompson has enough experience experience and enough confidence to have patience that Kansas State's offense is predicated on putting one specific player in conflict and then waiting for that person to make a decision then taking advantage of that decision he is really really good at that and that's why Kansas State is able to run so much more efficiently with him at the helm it's gonna be interesting to see what they do tonight against Iowa State but for the Cyclones they had a really good game against Kansas right before this bye week and then coming out of it you almost have to carry that momentum maybe you don't want that bye week almost because you want to to carry that over into the next week. Yeah, Kansas is not good. Uh, yeah. we, are, we talked about it before. <laughs> but what Iowa State did is if it's a bad team, you should absolutely execute on all cylinders, fire a complete 100% against that bad team. And they did. Mm -hmm. And so good teams play well against bad teams. Well, yeah, you want to continue that momentum. The good news that Iowa State has is that they still have a couple dings and injuries that they're trying to get healthy. They should be able to get guys like Brees Hall, guys like Charlie Kohler, get them to back to 100% to play a much tougher team in a much tougher location in Manhattan. And then you look across the Big 12, it felt like Iowa State might have been out of it after that Baylor game. Like it was just kind of concerning. But you look up and down, Oklahoma's beatable, Texas is clearly beatable. I mean, it's been interesting to see Oklahoma the front runner though right now. Yeah, Oklahoma is the front runner, but we saw how vulnerable they are. If they turn the ball over, I mean, whether it's Williams or Rattler or whomever, if they're turning the ball over, that defense and their supporting cast are not as good as they have been in years past. So you got teams like Texas who in, were just an inverse of Oklahoma. Their second half was bad. Oklahoma's first half was bad. So both those teams are capable of this Jekyll and Hyde thing. We haven't seen Oklahoma State play a real quality opponent, which they're going to get to on Saturday with Texas. So now now you have the big boys, which I would say Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Baylor, maybe throw TCU in there. You got six real legitimate chances of quality teams who are going to have to beat the bejesus out of each other all the way throughout the half of the, or the second half of the season. So it is a big wide open conference without a true favorite, which is good news for Iowa State. And Iowa State plays the bulk of those tough teams at home this year at Jack Trice, which will also be crucial. You had Texas and Okie State at home. I think those are two big ones. Because we've seen what Texas can do in a, a neutral environment. You don't want to play them at home. I think you get them in the crowd at Jack Trice, and, and they're beatable. And you get them in the crowd at Jack Trice in November. It's yeah. a team from the south, and whether or not people want to admit it, it is hard to go from one climate of warm to another climate of cold. So the later in the season it gets, the less these teams want to come up. I mean, the first time that Texas has play, played in Ames in November was 2015. So it has been a it, – it, it does not happen often where you get Texas late in the season in yep. the cold weather because it's not a comfortable place for them to exist. It might be a good thing to see Bijan Robinson that time of year as well. All righty, when we come back, we're going to break down the Hawkeyes. Plus, Jeff checks in from the whiteboard this week. Looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us this morning. A busy day in college football for Iowa teams, but there's been a lot of chatter about that Iowa win over Penn State. Jeff is at the whiteboard to break down that game winning touchdown. Welcome back to the whiteboard. We're going to talk today about the biggest play that Iowa has had this entire season and for a few years that touchdown pass to Spencer Peaches through to Nico Reganey. But in order to understand that play, we have to understand what happened before it and how Iowa got to the position where they can actually run the play they want to run. So in the very start of the game, Iowa came out and they ran a lot of what is called an ace formation. So ace meaning one back, two tight ends, and then two wide receivers that are off the ball. Well, 
Spencer Petras to this point in the season has not been a dominant passer and even on Saturday wasn't a dominant passer. So I wanted to give him a little bit more responsibility. This is a balanced formation you can run and pass at about an equivalent amount out of. Well, Penn State dared them to throw the ball. In the very first part of the game, they had eight, not only in the box, they had eight within four yards of the line of scrimmage and they were daring Iowa, please throw because we think our athletes are better than your athletes because your quarterback can't get it there. Iowa realized, okay, this isn't going to work after Spencer Peters goes one for nine with 14 yards and one interception, and they decide to take a little bit of a different approach. The different approach is they said, you might be athletic and aggressive, and what your benefit is, your best attribute as a defense, Penn State, is your aggression and your athleticism. We got strength. And so they went back to, to majoring in a two-back, two-tight end set. Well, Penn State still wants to have all of this clustered in there, but now they're giving up size. They've got a fullback, two tight ends, and they're still playing with their base corners and their athletic but a little bit undersized linebackers. So Iowa starts to develop this strength. They start running the ball to this formation. Tyler Goodson starts to get a big amount of roll. They run a couple play action passes out of this. They start to click a little bit. Well, they go from this passive offense or a little bit trying to get Spencer Peters to do it to this really dominant Iowa offense which makes every defensive eyeball focus on number 15 which sets up the final play what's going to happen they have this this setup of a too tight set to one side with Tyler Goodson being in the backfield saying that we are going to run the ball because for the past two quarters they've gone to this jumbo set they've brought themselves back to what they want to do which is run the ball and run play action off of it our, uh, Penn State is going to run a cover three with these three guys. They're going to run off and run off. And all we're going to do at this point is we're going to run a little bit of a counter action to get the tailback to put this guy in stress. And from here, Nico Regani is going to run to catch this eyes or the, this free safety's eyes, flip his hips, and run backwards. They caught Penn State in a situation where a play action pass down the field was going to work because they adjusted their scheme, went back to a heavy set, and they got the run fake to actually be worthwhile to give Petrus time to throw to a wide open Nico Regani for a game winning touchdown. Good stuff there, Jeff. Always enjoy the play breakdown there on the whiteboard. And, and I think it brings us to a good point here. That can't happen if Tyler Goodson is not running well. And I think that's got to be the case once again today against Purdue. Tyler Goodson is the key. He is the cornerstone, the key, whatever metaphor you want to use for the thing that makes this offense work. I mean, Sam Laporta, great tight end. Spencer Petras, capable quarterback, is going to get it around. Guys like Reganey, you know, guys like Bruce, they have playmakers. But without Tyler Goodson, this offense cannot exist in the way that it wants to exist. So his success is directly correlative to the offensive success of the Iowa Hawkeyes. So as good as he is, he needs to continue being good. Again, especially as we talk about the rest of their season isn't as hard as the first half of their season has been, but they're going to get to a Big Ten championship game. Likely, they're going to have to play Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, somebody, Penn State maybe again on the other half of the conference. And if they're going to expect to win that game, that player has to be a special, special player. I asked Reggie Bush last week, actually, when I on the sidelines, I said, who would you take right now, Brees or Tyler? And, and it wasn't a knock against Brees but he said Tyler Goodson because he's used in the passing game. He's used in the running game. He's seen how dynamic he can be. And it, when you have a multifaceted running back like that, He's a great weapon. He is, and I got to give a shout out to to Potabom, his fullback. Yes. As a <laughs> as a run as a running back, your fullback is your first set of eyes. He's going to be your corrector. He's going to be the guy that if someone gets a run through, he's going to pick him up so you can actually make a move on a safety instead of making a move on a defensive tackle. So Potabom cleans up a lot of the mess to allow Goodson to be open. And again, we talked about how quintessentially important he is for the Iowa offense. They have to get him in the passing game. They have to get him in the running game because they have to draw those eyeballs in. In order to keep Spencer Petrus comfortable, they got to keep eyeballs on 15 to allow Petrus to be able to connect with his wide receivers and tight ends. And really quick today, the, the secondary is going to be key. They've been great all season long. I think 16 interceptions this year so far. I mean, Riley Moss not going to be in the lineup today, but still going to be an interesting dynamic because Purdue loves to throw the ball everywhere. They love to throw the ball up and down the field. Uh, it is one of the things that Iowa has 
one of the most fun teams to defenses to watch on film because they just play so together. It's such a connected defense. You're going to get pressure with the defensive lineman. It's going to allow a linebacker to keep his eyes free and understand he can be a little bit more aggressive because he knows that he's not going to the quarterback's not going to be back there for 10 minutes. He's going to have three seconds to throw because the D line's going to be there. Well, that allows him to be aggressive in going after the ball to tip it up to get it to a safety. Well, then a safety because he knows that his linebackers and his defensive linemen are doing their job. He can, you know, keep his eyes on the ball rather than kind of fading with the wide receiver. So all of these guys play from level to level, from player to player, connected defense. That's what makes this defense special. It's not any one player. It's not one guy that you go, man, he's a stud. Mm -hmm. You look at all the whole 11 and you say this 11 plays tremendous together. All righty. And on that note, Big Ten, you mentioned it. The East is where the strength of this conference lies. Ohio State, that front runner right now. Michigan, Michigan State right there too, but Ohio State's got to be the front runner. Ohio State is what everyone measures everything to in the conference. It's the Alabama of the Big Ten. If you can beat Ohio State, you then earn your way to call yourself the Big Ten champion. Iowa doesn't have that crossover that plays Ohio State that many times, so they're only going to be able to play Ohio State in a championship game. Well, if you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. So the East right now is stronger. West right now has Iowa. That's going to be a big matchup if they can take, if both sides can take care of business to get there. Will be a fun one to see as it all shakes out. We'll get to the three keys next for Iowa and Iowa State to come away with the dub. That's next on Cyhawk Game Day. So we've broken down both the Hawkeyes and the Cyclones and their respective conferences. Let's get into the three keys today, Jeff, for Iowa State to come away with the dub over there at Kansas State. Kansas State is known for their special teams, so you have to be at least adequate. Don't let special teams beat you with one of the best units in the nation going against you. Second thing is establish the run. We talked about how Tyler Goodson is the key for the Iowa offense. Brees Hall is that for the Iowa State offense. And if you're playing defense against this Kansas State offense that likes to put you in conflict, the way you can control that is keep and hold the edges of your defense. Don't let them get out for these 7, 10, 12, 15-yard chunk plays. Make them earn it all the way down the field and execute as all 11 together. And then for the Iowa Hawkeyes, Jeff, number one, don't buy the hype. Look, I get it. You're number two in the country, but you haven't put the game together to prove, in my opinion, that you are, in fact, the second best team in the nation. Number two for me, I mean, don't get beat deep. We talked about the secondary, how dynamic they are, but David Bell is probably one of the best wide receivers in the entire country. Purdue loves to throw the ball. Oh, and Brom kind of has Iowa's number. So keep that in mind. The number three, take some shots already, all right? I'm fine with seeing Spencer Petrus push the ball down the field a little bit more. Maybe make a mistake or two. It's okay because your defense is going to be there to bail them out. Yeah, the Iowa defense can fix a lot of mistakes. And again, we, you look at you look down the road, Ohio State, Michigan, whatever. They're going to have to take some shots to beat those big boys in the East. So get Spencer Petrus comfortable with that. And on that note, we'll be right back on Cyhawk Game Day to wrap things up. Plus, the pick five. That's next. Alrighty, welcome back in. Time now for the pick five. Jeff, I'm a few picks under 500 this year. They're at 13, 16, and one, but this is my week to get back on track. We're going to okay? do it. We're we going to find it. a way, although you don't like half my picks. That's okay. TCU, 13 and a half. That's my play against Oklahoma. The Sooners can score, but apparently so can everyone else. I think Max Duggan has a solid showing. Plus, you mentioned it, freshman quarterback at OU started. Well, Caleb Williams is going to be starting for uh, Oklahoma, and you have a game, at least a half of game film now, so he's not a complete enigma. You have some idea, so Gary Patterson's going to be able to scheme a little bit against OU. Like the Horned Frogs to cover there, and Nebraska, Minnesota. Nebraska minus four. Look, I know I ragged on them all season. I picked them last week to cover. That was a push against Michigan, but I think they get the job done pretty handedly against Minnesota today. You can't argue, no matter what your, no matter what your feelings are towards Nebraska. <laughs> They are getting substantially better. Going to break through at some point. Minus four is good enough against Minnesota. All righty, top 15 matchup in Athens, Georgia. Kentucky Wildcats visiting the Bulldogs. 21 and a half point dog here are the Wildcats. Look, 40 some top 25 teams have lost already. I'm not saying Kentucky's going to upset them, but I think they cover 21. I don't know. No? Georgia's, Georgia's really good. They're uh, so good. <laughs> I mean, Kentucky historically loses these games badly. But I'm, I'm, I'm sold on the Wildcats this year. I just don't think anybody's going to take down Georgia this year. All right, sprinkle some money line. Why not? All right, Iowa State at Kansas State. Look, I get Iowa State should win this game. I think they do, but 
Weird things happen. Weird stuff happens in Manhattan. So whether it's going to be a huge blowout or some, there's an animal that runs in the field and they stop the game for 15 minutes. I don't know. Minnesota, or weird stuff happens in Manhattan. You know, Skylar Thompson's back as well. I think Kansas State covers here. I don't think Iowa State loses though. Iowa Purdue, Purdue plus 11 and a half is my play. Look again, not knocking Iowa here. I just think Purdue's kind of got the number. Jeff Brom, very good against the Hawkeyes. It's hard for me to think that teams are going to score enough to even compete with Iowa unless you are again an Ohio State or a Michigan. I think Iowa by more than 11 and a half. All righty. Should be a fun day of college football. We'll get you going next week here again on Cyhawk Game Day.